Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number 32, and I'm going to discuss the physical electric dipole. There are many videos previous to this which are relevant in one form or another, and I've written most of the titles on the left hand side of your screen. I'd like you to pay particular attention to videos 20 and 28. So, the topic of the electric dipole is very important for your study in electrostatics and later in electrodynamics. To I suppose give you just one example, there is a quantity which is known as the electric dipole moment and this is basically the fundamental building block for calculating the electric field. And without that you I suppose you find it very difficult and cumbersome to calculate the electric field. And that all follows from the theory I will discuss in this video. But there are some subtleties in this topic and many people I suppose when beginning to study the electric dipole will think that the theory is quite straightforward but will later on realize that it's actually quite subtle and uh, they have to, I suppose, that they missed pieces when they were initially studying it. So I hope to be able to address all of those before we begin, or before we um, end this video. So first of all, let's define what a physical electric dipole is. A physical electric dipole has two oppositely charged particles that are separated by a certain distance, and I call it D. Now, the reason it's important to note that they are separated by a distance is because we also define the pure electric dipole as when two oppositely charged particles have zero distance between them. So, the thing we're trying to do here is to find the potential when the sum of the charges is zero. So, we have two charges, they are opposite in, uh, in parity, or they're opposite in charge, and as a result, the sum of the charges is zero. So this is a neutral charge configuration. And what we're trying to do is find and calculate the potential of this particular charge arrangement. So we know, of course, at this stage, that the, the potential for a point charge, as written on the top right of your screen, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the charge magnitude divided by the separation vector. So in this particular case, what we have is we have charges, we, uh, the plus Q charge, and we also have the minus Q charge. They're separated by a distance d, and we have placed a detector at a certain distance away. So we have two separation vectors. We have the separation vector for the negative charge and the separation vector for the positive charge. And of course, we have our, our uh, normal R vector as well. So that's, I suppose, from the origin. Note, by the way, how I define the angle theta here. It's the angle between... Uh, well, it's best just to show you where it is rather than describe where it is. So this particular angle here is the angle of theta. So how do we calculate the electric potential for this particular arrangement? Well, we have two point charges, and we know that the electric potential obeys the superposition principle. This means we can factor out the 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, and we have the charge Q plus, or so the positive charge, divided by its separation vector. And we need to take away from that or we need to add to that the negative charge divided by its separation vector. The reason we have this negative sign here is, is because the, there is a negative charge. So I suppose if you want, you could write it this way. So plus minus Q, if you want. Okay, but I think it's just easier to write the negative sign in straight away. Now, if you look at my video on vector calculus for electromagnetism number four, I discussed the law of cosines. And the law of cosines says that if you define two vectors a and b, and then define a third vector c, which is their difference, so it's a minus b, then c squared is a squared plus b squared minus twice the product of their magnitudes multiplied by the cosine of theta. So it should be pretty obvious to you why I would define theta, because we're going to be using the law of cosines. So I'm just going to redefine theta up here. So what I'm going to do is note that the positive separation vector is the vector r minus d over 2, because I suppose that, that's a vector going in this direction here. So d over 2 is a vector going upwards in the upward direction as you look, whereas minus d over 2 is going in the, in the downward direction as you would look. So the negative separation vector is r plus d over 2, and the positive separation vector is r minus d over 2. Note, of course, that we can apply the law of cosines, and we're able to add both of those, or we're not, we're not able to add them, but we're able to get the, uh, the square here. So that's pretty straightforward stuff. And uh, what I've done is I've just factored it out and made it 
uh, you'll see why I factored it out in a moment. But we factored it out into three particular parts because I took out the factor of r squared here. All right. So all we've done is gotten the square of the plus or minus separation vector. Okay. And you'll have to forgive me, I suppose, if, if I haven't written the, uh, the vector sign. But that's actually, in this case, it isn't a vector. Sorry, that isn't a vector. Okay, moving on. So we seek to apply a Maclaurin expansion uh, to the expression we got there on the previous page. Because at the moment it's it's quite cumbersome still. We have we have three terms and we have have to multiply it by r squared. But I suppose you should know at this stage, any time that we have something to be squared, we'll always try and apply a Taylor or Maclaurin expansion to it. So the Maclaurin is when we center it at zero. And you know we'll have, let's say, one plus or minus, um, let's say, x to the power of something small. There's an m there. What we'll try and do is bring in the something small in front of the x. Okay, so if we're talking about a square root, for example, we'll bring in a factor of a half. So here what we have is I've inverted this, the, the expression, so we've won over the plus or minus separation vector like this. And we can see, of course, that now we have a power of minus a half up here. So what would, like I said, we, I, there, and thereafter I took the square root, of course. Now, if you look, we want to evaluate in the region where r is gr much greater than d. So what this means is that our observer, or our detector here, is much further away, or is, is much further away, or its, its magnitude, its length, is much greater than the separation between the two charges. So we're, it, we're trying to find what somebody very, very far away would measure if they wanted to measure the electric potential. Okay, so if you look at this then, we have d squared over 4 r squared. But we're saying here that r is very, very big in comparison with d. And as a result, this term is approximately 0. If you want, you can look at thermodynamics video 14 next, because that's where I, I, I discussed applying the, uh, the Taylor and Maclaurin um, series uh, for a square root. So what I've done here is I've brought in the, the, the exponent of minus a half, and I've just multiplied it in here with the, uh, the d over, or excuse me, the d over r cos theta. All right, notice by the way, it's minus one half, so as a result, I had to invert the, uh, the plus or minus here. So it's minus plus up top, and then later on it becomes plus or minus. All right, so if you look at this closely, we have, this is, this is the formula for both separation vectors. So if we uh, take them up, take them away, we get one over r outside of d over r cos theta. All right. Uh, so multiplying that in, we get this particular formula here. So this is the difference between uh, the inverted separation vectors, or the magnitude of the inverted separation vectors. But going back to our electric potential, the reason we were doing all of this manipulation is, is for the following reason. If we have the same value of the charge, so say it's it's q plus and q minus, and they, well they're going to be the same value because that's the definition of the uh, the electric or the electric dipole. So that means we can bring out this this charge of q, and we have we have the following inside. So it's one over the positive separation vector minus one over the negative separation vector, which is exactly what we have down here. Putting it all together, we get the approximate value for the potential of a physical electric dipole. It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. The charge multiplied by the, the separation between the charges, the cosine of the angle theta, and divided by r squared. And r is the distance from the origin to the observer. Notice, of course, that it falls off at 1 over r squared, not 1 over r. And we saw earlier on that the uh, potential for a point charge it falls off at 1 over r. Now if you wanted you could plot this uh, on a graph and you would get the following you would get the following uh, uh, well, field or if you uh, you get the the lines in this for this particular potential. So the potential looks something like this. And this is pretty important because later on we will be discussing the pure dipole where these charges here are no longer separated by a uh, finite distance d. And you might say well so what what is the the importance of this? I'm about to come to that. So what we've seen so far is that we have the potential of a point charge, so we call it a monopole, and if it's a positive charge, it's going to drop off at 1 over r. We've just seen that the potential of a dipole falls off at 1 over r squared. And I can tell you that the potential of a quadrupole falls off at 1 over r cubed, 
and that the potential of an octopole falls off at 1 over uh, r to the 4. So you can imagine as you as you keep adding charges you can uh, calculate the uh, electric dipole or excuse me the electric potential as a result. Now the important part I think is about to come. Why are we interested in electric dipoles at all? Well I suppose mathematically our challenge has always been to calculate the electric field and we know at this stage that we try to simplify this process by using the scalar potential. So what I've done derived here is the scalar potential uh, approx the approximate scalar potential for a physical electric dipole and then we just apply the formula that um, E is equal to minus the gradient of the electric potential and what we have is the electric field so that's pretty straightforward to calculate now thus far we've only discussed the potential of a dipole uh, well in this particular video and in previous videos we discussed the potential for a monopole now I've indicated that the potential of course changes as you alter the charge. So we have a monopole, a dipole, a quad quadrupole, an octopole and so on. And obviously the potential is going to be changed as we add or subtract charges. And of course each notice, and it's very important, that everything really comes down to powers of 1 over R. Now in the next video I will discuss the potential of an arbitrary charge setup. So you might, you, you would have, you want to not just calculate the potential of a monopole or a dipole, but an arbitrary charge setup of, let's say, a person, you, you know, if you, if you potentially wanted to calculate that. Now, I could tell you in advance that in order to do that, we basically talk about a power series of 1 over R. And this shouldn't seem strange to you because already we've seen the monopole is 1 over r, dipole 1 over r squared, quadrupole 1 over r cubed, octopole 1 over r to the 4. So it seems like we, it, I suppose this is suggesting that if we keep adding up all the terms, it, it, it's looking like a power series. And we know that power series are very good at approximating functions. To, uh, like I said, they're uh, very good at approximating functions. So in the next video, what we'll see is that the potential for an arbitrary charge distribution will be nothing else but the potential for a monopole plus the potential for a dipole plus the potential for a quadrupole and so on off to infinity. Now, if you know something about uh, power series, you'll probably know that some terms naturally go to zero and some terms are naturally non-zero, depending on the setup that you're talking about. And that is the important point here that sometimes the most important point, the most important uh, contribution will be from the monopole. Other times the most important contribution will be from the dipole. And these two contribute the majority of uh, um, times. However, higher order terms like the quad, the octo and so on contrib contribute um, more f infrequently. So due to the one over r nature or the, the powers of one, order, one over r, the lower order terms clearly dominate. So 1 over r and 1 over r squared versus 1 over r to the 100, for example. But what's important to note is that the monopole dominates when the sum of the charges is non-zero. So when you actually have a charged body. So if you have one charge, let's say, plus q. You don't have an additional minus q to balance the charges, so you have a net charge. So when you have a net net charge of one, um, let's say one unit, the monopole term in the potential dominates and all the other terms can be ignored. Sometimes those terms are zero. However, when the sum of the charges is zero and you have a neutral body, the monopole term goes to zero and the dipole term dominates over all the other terms like the quadrupole and the octopole term. So the bottom line really is that the potential of an arbitrary charge distribution whose sum of the charges is non-zero is approximately the monopole term. However, the potential of an arbitrary charge distribution which is neutral or the sum of the charges is zero is approximately the potential of a dipole. So that is why the properties of a physical electric dipole are so important because if you understand the physical electric dipole then you're able to calculate the potential and therefore the electric field of almost all or we'll say many uh, neutral bodies. So just to sum up then in the next video we're going to see that each term can be simplified by defining what's known as a moment 
And you might have heard of this in the past. So, like for example, you might have the dipole moment or the mono monopole moment or what have you. But we focus upon calculating the moments when we see uh, the electric field. So up until now, we've been calculating the field by calculating the potential. But what we'll see soon is that in actual fact, it's easier to concentrate on calculating the moment because thereafter the, the potential and the field themselves fall out very quickly. Now, because the dipole term is the most important term in the uh, potential for an arbitrary distribution when you're talking about neutral bodies, clearly we're going to focus on the, the dipole moment or the electric dipole moment. And just to show that for you, in the next video we'll see that this is the formula for the, uh, electric, the potential for an electric dipole, this particular integral here. And what we do is we define basically the integral itself to be the electric dipole moment and as a result we are able to simplify the uh, equation or the functional form of the dipole potential and you can see very you can see quickly that it's, it's after been simplified now it's for that reason that dipoles are so important that they are for neutral bodies that the dominant potential term for neutral bodies and that calculating the dipole moment allows us to calculate the potential and thereafter very quickly the electric uh, the electric field itself so that's my introduction to the physical electric dipole. Uh, thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.